Good morning, and welcome to this service of Holy Communion, the Eucharist, this week according to the Book of Common Prayer. Everything you need for the service will be found through the leaflet, uh, which will direct you to the Blue Hymnal and Burgundy Prayer Book. This is Ascension Sunday. It is the Sunday after Ascension Day. Would you rise, please, as we begin? <coughs>
children, please come up to the pastoral tent. Good morning. So uh, just before we do our prayer, I just wanted to get you guys to take a really close look at that center window there. That's the, that's the ascension. So it says to remind us of, well, everything here is physical reminders of <coughs> Jesus and God. Take a good look, because what happens when you don't have that physical reminder? Okay? So look at it closely. Check the colors. Okay, now let's do our prayer. Giving and loving God, on Ascension Sunday, remember we remember your loving actions in this world. The sending of your Son and the glory of your rising from death at Easter. We recognize that we are never alone. Help us, with patience, to witness your presence in a world that needs your love. Strengthen us with your Spirit, and let your light shine through us. Amen. Amen. This is the last time we're going to light the Paschal candle in quite a while. And Dia, would you like to help? Please rise for our children.
strength we receive to the Almighty God. But like that we do believe thy only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who have ascended into the heavens, so we may also in heart and mind thither ascend and with him continually remain, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. O God, the King of glory, who hast exalted thy only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph unto the kingdom of heaven. We beseech thee, leave us not comfortless, but send to us thy Holy Ghost to comfort us and exalt us into the same place whither our Savior Christ is gone before, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Please remain seated for the Lord. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Ghost Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Here in the lesson. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
The second lesson is written in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, beginning at the first chapter in the 15th verse. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus <coughs> and your love towards all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your hearts enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable, immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here endeth the lesson. Please rise for the graduate of the gospel.
with you. And with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is written in the Gospel according to St. Luke in the 24th chapter, <clears throat> beginning at the 44th verse. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus said to them, These are my words to you that I spoke while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer, and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. <coughs> so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise be to the Lord of Christ. <clears throat> Please turn to your prayer books to page 71 so we can together confess our faith. O oh Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouths shall perform thy praise. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, 
Well, what shall we say? What shall we say about the ascension? <coughs> or, better yet, what does the ascension say about us? The ascension, the story of the ascension, the reference to the ascension, is part of the very heart of our faith. But it comes out differently in the scriptures in different places. In the Matthew 28, 16 to 20, Glass at the back of the church, along Barrington at the north end, we see the ending of the gospel with Jesus giving the commission to his disciples. As in the gospel, the departure of Jesus is implied, but it's not stated, and there is no narrative, as it were. In the gospel, according to St. Mark, in the longer ending, we have a kind of summary of other oral traditions that were in the early church. And the ascension is referred to, but in a way not really elaborated. In the Gospel according to St. John, we have sort of several endings, each very deeply meaningful, none of them the story of Jesus' departure. And yet in the Gospel of John, especially in the farewell before the death and resurrection of Jesus, the departure of Jesus is understood and explained, and the coming of the Holy Spirit is anticipated. It is in the Gospel of Luke and in the Acts of the Apostle, the very last verses of the Gospel of Luke, and the opening verses of the Acts of the Apostles, that we hear what we could call a narrative. And that narrative is not identical. As with the other accounts of the passing from Christ's earthly life to his heavenly life, the stories in those two are different. This is the Luke 24 window, and you can tell for several reasons. Uh, first of all, we move directly from death on the left to resurrection on the right to ascension in the middle. Sorry about that. I'm going to have to turn this off. And so you can see that as in Luke's story, the three follow one right after another. In Luke's gospel, it's as if there weren't 40 days in between, 40 days being very meaningful at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. But there's another reason. In the story that we have just heard read to us, we see that Jesus is blessing them as he is taken away. And if you look, you can see Jesus' right hand extended in blessing as he turns from them and they look up and he is taken from their sight. So these are the narratives of the, what we call the ascension of Jesus. Now there's a lot there and there's a lot to be probed and we know that very early on the ascension was annually celebrated. St. Augustine says, he was born maybe 300 years after the epistles of St. Paul. St. Augustine says that the Ascension was one of those dates that was annually celebrated as a tradition a long time before he became a Christian and was received into the church. So the question is, what do we do with this? I think we should take our clue from the 47th Psalm in the language that we've sung, in slightly altered language, God has gone up with a merry noise, or with a shout. It's a psalm long associated with this annual feast that we call the Feast of the Ascension. And of course, people have thought a lot about this. Our ancestors amongst the ancient people of God have thought about it. Was it about the Ark of the Covenant, upon which God was understood to descend in his spiritual presence, and then ascend. Was it about the battles? Because it sounds like a triumph after a battle, maybe after the entry into the Holy Land, after which God ascends. But it could also be a reference to the enthronement of God. There was no God greater in the ancient Near East, or rather no king, in the ancient Near East than the Assyrian king who was called the great king. 
But this psalm asserts, as do the Hebrews, our ancestors, that God Almighty is the great King, and this psalm alludes to his enthronement. Perhaps annually reenacted, we don't know. God is the great King who ascends to his throne. And this is certainly the line at which, upon which St. Paul was thinking in the passage that we heard from the epistle to the church at Ephesus, to the Ephesians. In that passage, we see the same rapid progress of Jesus Christ at the end of the Incarnation. We see his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his enthronement. And here is what we learn about ourselves. In that epistle, it is said that the Christ who is ascended the throne is the head of which we are the body. Christ is the head of which we are the body, and he has ascended to the throne. And the church soon made the connection. John Chrysostom said, when it comes to the ascension, Human nature itself has gone up with Christ and sits with Christ. We have ascended with Christ. Long ago, we believed, and hopefully we will always confess, that we were created in the image of God. We're not thinking here of the wonderful variety of faces and colors and shapes and sizes and places that we are or that we come from. That is just part of who we are. But we're speaking about the image of God in our mind and heart and soul. What makes us human is the image of God, and it is shared by all. It is this image of God that has reascended and been reunited with God the Father through Jesus Christ. We, the Church, are stuck to Christ the Head. And it is so easy to forget that. But Paul does it, the Apostle, time and again. Christ is the head, we are the body. <clears throat> but what are we to think then? How are we to live? Well, there's a passage in the Apostle, the, the Acts of the Apostles, that you probably noted. The disciples asked, is the kingdom of God going to be inaugurated now? Is it going to happen? And Jesus says, no, that's not what this ascension is going to be about. But in fact, that's exactly what has gone wrong. I think you know that for many centuries, the church understood itself to be building the kingdom of God on earth. They did not listen to the warning. Though mighty cathedrals were built, great works of art, wonderful philosophical systems, many wonderful and great things created, but a delusion set in that the kingdom of God was here. And kingdoms of God fought against other kingdoms of God, destroying other images of God. And that is exactly what Jesus said the Ascension is not about. Well, then what is it about? We are to pray with our minds and hearts, with our hands and with our feet, that the image of God in every one of us will be seen as restored in Jesus Christ. That means we can't trash anyone else in the literal sense that it so often happens. Because look around you, look around you. Images of God everywhere in this building. And not just here, said, our, said the ancients, but in all of creation itself. We can't trash each other when we're looking at the image of God restored through the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. We must pray with our hands, with our hearts and our eyes and our feet. Pray that the image of God <clears throat> will be so evident that we will live differently. 
But there's something else here, and I know that our theologian, our parish theologian, will explain it all next Sunday, on Pentecost Sunday. We are waiting for the Holy Spirit. It's like the Nativity. Every year we wait, we know, but we're reminded of the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is called Expectation Sunday. I don't know if you knew that, but it has been called that in the past. And in a way, it's true. We are between last Thursday, the Ascension of Christ, and next Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. And I think this should be our prayer. That we see each other as part of the body of Christ. And we see the world around us as made and restored and ascended with Christ. And that we leave the politics and the policies the programs which we hurl at each other aside because it is God who will bring the kingdom not us in the name of God Father Son and Holy Spirit Amen. rise for our offertory hymn.
Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, forever and ever. All that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. 